This episode is brought to you by Comcast. Over the next decade, Comcast is committing $1 billion to reach 50 million low-income Americans with the tools they need to succeed in a digital world. Learn more at comcast.com slash education. Empire. Hello and welcome to my podcast. Today, I'm joined by the Washington Post, Nikki Javala and Sam 48 as we go over Washington's draft class. Nikki provides some really good insight into linebacker Jamin Davis. She wrote an in-depth story on him recently that you should check out. We discuss which players stand out, who intrigues us the most, and has the door closed on Ryan Kerrigan's return. It's really to say, it's really hard to say how good a draft class is or isn't until they play. Not any given grades. On paper, it looks good here, but I've seen a lot of things that look good here on paper over the years. I like that there has been an, an adherence to the culture building the past two off seasons, and it's continued this weekend. I, I do think as far as culture goes, sometimes that word gets thrown on, thrown around a little bit too much, but it is important, and they've stuck to that. I like the mentality of this group, from Davis to Sam Cosme, to, and, you know, who is a good athlete for people who read the analysis, whatever, and Benjamin St. Juice, among others. That matters. I'm intrigued most by the receiver from North Carolina, De'Ami Brown, because of how he can expand the offense's versatility. We'll get into all that during our conversation. The other thing is, this offense is going to be better than last year, and they don't have their quarterback in the future but this offense should be a lot better because of that added speed and, and the versatility of what those receivers can do. They're not all the same kind of guy. I'm not surprised at all that they did not draft a quarterback. I do know that I have told you all along that there were guys that they liked and I felt like they, and I do know that what I've heard along is that and what they've said publicly too, is that they'd like to find that person, but they're not in a rush to do it. It could take a year or two. I've heard that phrase often, often. I definitely know there were QBs they liked in this draft, but the guy for the future is someone you have to love. So they will keep building that roster and try again next year. And it also didn't make sense. You reach a certain point in the draft where if you don't think that guy can beat out the guys on your roster, there's no use drafting them. So it's not just about finding a quarterback. It's about finding the right quarterback. Build that roster and drop them in. That's been the, that is the strategy that they're gonna, that they're going to keep to. So, the, you know, it, it could take a year, could take another two years, or could take two more years. But I'm going to get all that, and I'm going to get into all that for an article later this week on ESPN.com, so check that out. And over the next week or several weeks, I'll be bringing you insight into these picks from coaches or writers or the players themselves. So keep listening, folks. I appreciate it. Okay, that's enough from me. After this break, I'll be back with Nikki Javala and Sam Fortier from the Washington Post. Support for this podcast comes from CDW and Intel. At CDW, we get that even the biggest jobs need to fit on your lap. It's true. My entire workday happens right here on my lap. And you can get it done faster with the performance and security of a device configured by CDW and powered by the Built for Business Intel vPro platform. Nice. Are you done yet, Mommy? More time for story time. And even better use of your lap. IT orchestration by CDW. People who get it. Find out more at cdw.com slash intel client. Hey, everyone. I want to tell you about a fun new offer from Monkey Knife Fight that can enhance any sports experience, whether you're at a game, on your couch, or in a bar. It's a daily fantasy sports league that is easy to play. You can sign up on monkeyknifefight.com using promo code JKR and play games such as more or less. Will an NBA player score more or less than a listed point total? You can do the same in baseball. Will a pitcher have more or less strikeouts than a given amount, etc.? It's fun. And every Friday, it's home run derby. And on three guys who have home runs that night, all three hit one, you share in the prize pool. Every week, you can participate in their eagle eye jackpot based on the PGA Tour. Choose from any sport, from NASCAR to UFC and League of Legends. And of course, once football rolls back around, there will be even more fun prop bets. This is daily sports betting designed for the average fan to use their knowledge and have some fun. Sign up now at monkeyknifefight.com and use promo code JKR. 
That's promo code JKR. Welcome back. Now here's my conversation with Nikki and Sam. All right, well, it's been a long weekend for everybody. For you guys, I was dealing with my son's graduation. So you guys are monitoring this like every minute of this weekend. So I am curious. Let's start with your initial thoughts on there. I'm not asking for grades, just initial thoughts on, on how this weekend went for Washington. I thought it went pretty well. I, I think this year is tougher for the team, but also tougher for us covering it just because I don't feel like I know as much about the guys in the latter rounds, just like they probably felt like they didn't. Um, so it's it's tough to kind of gauge how they really did. I felt like they hit a number of their biggest needs, which was big, you know, the getting Jamin Davis, probably a, th- a three down linebacker to start. Um, Sam Cosme, you know, you got possibly, hopefully the, your left tackle, you know, I thought they added some interesting pieces to the secondary that could be versatile. They, you know, hit a number of their Ron Rivera themes, as I call it, just in terms of speed, versatility, character. Um, so I think on paper, it looks pretty good, but you know, there have been other signings, other classes that have looked pretty good and don't always pan out once you hit the field. Yeah, to me, this was just another example in the blueprint of we are going to build all of our pieces, we're going to build our team, and we're going to go find that quarterback later. And I don't just mean in the fact that they didn't draft a quarterback. I mean that in the way that they've kind of approached the two free agencies and the previous draft when Ron Rivera was here. They didn't necessarily swing big on on the big name other than obviously Chase Young, but it's been a very... uh, steady, understated process. And I think that when you look at, you know, Samuel Cosme or, um, uh, you know, Benjamin St. Juice, like those type of guys may be understated, but, but fit this program. And and really, um, I think it it just, it just follows the mold of, Hey, we're going to build this, a complete well-rounded team. And we're going to go find that quarterback later that, that could put us in contention for a possible deep playoff run. And I want, Nikki, I want to get to your story on Jamin Davis in a minute because I think you have some good insight there. But sticking with Sam, with what you were talking about too, and there is a patient approach to building this that I think has been evident. Are you at all surprised by that? Are either one of you guys surprised by that, Sam? This is my second year covering the team, but from everything that uh, I've read and heard, this is maybe a surprising approach. Uh, in, in that they're not swinging big on the biggest names on the market. And, and really, I think, um, you know, this, this even goes back to, uh, to free agency, uh, Ron's first free agency, when, you know, Austin Hooper, the tight end, was, was seen as the big name, but you go with Logan Thomas instead. I mean, this to me is, uh, I, I would say it's surprising given, given franchise history. I would say it, it's not maybe when, when you look back at, uh, you know, the, the way that Carolina was built um, when Ron was there. Uh, so I guess to me, it, it, it makes sense. And, and whether it works out, um, whether, you know, Ron tries to keep that window open too long uh, when it does open. I mean, that, those are all questions for, for much later. But I guess in the initial part of this rebuild, um, it makes sense to me, at least. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't terribly surprised. Um, just kind of looking at the guys they signed last year and who they felt really good about from Logan Thomas. Um, I know they like J.D. McKissick. You know, a lot of guys that were generally unheralded signings in free agency and same for some of the guys in the draft, too. They, they kind of built their way up through guys that they believed could contribute in multiple ways and could find production, um, you know, where maybe they weren't given opportunities elsewhere. I, I think there are a lot of similarities to what Buffalo is doing now. Buffalo in year two, they went out and got their quarterback, but they had the they traded up to number seven for that. Um, and, and like Sam said, Ron has mentioned, you know, they want to kind of build around that position and, and then bring in their guy once the full team is ready. And I, it seems like a common sense approach, but so many teams don't do that, you know, and, and their younger quarterback or their less experienced quarterback is thrown into the fire and kind of gets killed, you know, be it behind a shoddy offensive line or not having many offensive weapons. So it, it seems like a a sound approach. Um, And, you know, I I thought we saw noticeable improvement in year one with Ron Rivera and, you know, by adding more pieces, I, you know, clearly the thinking is they'll take steady improvement until they can find that long-term guy at quarterback. 
Hey, Nikki, let's again, we're going to we'll get to other stuff. But Jamin Davis and you had some insight into him because you did write wrote a good story about him it was a couple of weeks ago. Correct. Mm -hmm. So for people who want to go check it out, Google Jamin Davis, Washington Post a couple of weeks ago. What did you when you when you were writing that story in the process of reporting it? What did you learn that? I mean, maybe you didn't learn a lot of things surprised you. But what were the things that you came away with from having learned about what you learned about? him? I learned that this guy was basically tailor made for what Ron Rivera was looking for. You know, the more I learned about him and, you know, his upbringing, who he was as a person, kind of his mentality, um, uh, some of the things he, he did to get where he is. Um, you know, he was a three-star recruit coming out of high school, was just a reserve, primarily a special teamer his first three seasons. And then he, he steps into a starting role. Another linebacker at Kentucky, um, was lost indefinitely. He suffered a stroke. Um, so Jamin gets opportunity there and he, he lights it up. I mean, this is a kid that came to Kentucky weighing all of like 195 pounds. And now he's this 235 pound kind of hulk of a human, but he can do multiple things. He's, he's kind of that coveted three down linebacker that, you know, he can cover, he's got speed, he's, you know, hard hitting tackler, um, but he's also, you know, you think about the things that Rivera likes and that he's kind of drawn to, you know, his parents are both army veterans. Um, this is a kid that's worked for every single thing he's gotten. A, he's, you talk to people that are, are close to him, they tell you what a great guy he is before, you know, the player, um, um, what a team first guy he is. Um, you know, so I, I think a lot of that speaks to Ron more so than any other coach. Um, he values that those personal aspects, especially in what he's trying to do in Washington. So I, as I got to know him, I, in, my, in the back of my head, I'm just like, Oh my gosh, this guy is like seriously tailor made for what Ron Rivera is trying to do. And, and to piggyback off that point, I think that, you know, he even not, not only is his family military, not only does he have a fondness for sayings, I think his favorite is you can't have a million dollar dream with a minimum wage work ethic. Uh, like, you know, there are just there are so many things that, that fit in that it almost in retrospect looks like he would have made a mistake by passing on him. Almost, I think, to the level that if you're a self-proclaimed pit master and you have a kid go to school at Alabama for four years, not going to Archibald to Northport. I would say that it's that it would have been that level of miss. <laughs> All right. That's a shot at me. That's from general Sam with his little civil war beard over there. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody can see that, but trust me, just go Google Andrew Luck, dearest mother. And you, that's, that's, what you <laughs> <laughs> but, but it is, it is, you know, it is funny um, with, with Jamin and it's, the military stuff definitely is going to appeal to Ron and just the way he does it. How did you see that military side? I know he was in the military, but having parents in there, how right. did you see that Nikki and just your dealings, you know, in that story kind of manifests itself? I think you see a, a kid that can adapt. I mean, he was born in Honolulu and then, you know, moved to, to Georgia. And I think a lot of it is in his work ethic. And I asked both his parents, you know, are there some, military like traits to the way he approaches the game. And I was kind of, I was trying to get at, you know, his work ethic, his mentality, how he, you know, his mindset with football. And um, they both kind of hedged at first, but they, but then they kind of realized that, yeah, his, his focus was very similar to theirs when they were in service. Um, and that he, once he really sets his mind to something that that's it, you know, he really puts his whole mind around it. And, you know, I was talking to his positional coaches, um, who is now a co-defensive coordinator at Kentucky, another former linebacker himself, John Summerall. And, you know, he was saying he, he never once has to ask Jamin to do more, to study more, to, you know, work harder, anything like that. In fact, he often had to tell him to slow down a bit. Um, and this past year, as he knew he was going to be a starter, really went that extra mile. So you kind of see that same mindset. And I mean, we all know that Ron is, gravitates toward players that are like that, that want to become more leaders and, um, you know, or, or workhorses and take well to coaching. And, and he, he, that's another trait he has. Hey, Sam, when you look at this, what they've done over the weekend, you know, we, Ron brought up the speed in the press conference too. 
does that, is, how much does that jump out to you as far as what they had, especially on offense? Yeah, especially on offense, I think, with, with uh, De'Ami Brown, the, the receiver at North Carolina, it sticks out most with, with him because this is a, that's the type of guy that when you watch his highlights, there's, there's not a ton of underneath stuff. I mean, he averaged for two years in a row 20 or more yards per catch. And so when you talk about I, – I think back to – it must have been one of the first four weeks last year when Ron said, look, you know, we just don't have the players – for Scott Turner to ha- make this offense look like he wants it to look. And, and it's probably not going to be so until 2021. You know, I, I think back to that uh, because now you are starting to see those pieces. It's not just Curtis Samuel. It's not just these other guys that are going to, you know, that, that run sub four or five uh, times in the 40 yard dash. It's, it's really just building, building that complete offense with a ton of weapons. And I think <laughs> you can even look at uh, Samuel Cos- Cosme, right? Uh, the tackle out of Texas who had that, uh, very nice uh, trick play that he scored on uh, when he caught the pass against West Virginia. So I'm sure Scott Turner, who who we know loves trick plays on national TV, uh, will let us see that at least once. What do you think, Nikki? I mean, speed was an obvious theme in this draft. I I agree with him. I I think Dayami was, was one of their, to me, it was an interesting pick because I also thought that was more tailored to Ryan Fitzpatrick too. I mean, just yep. he's the that deep ball, but it, it it also shows that they're trying to build, you know, a, a complete receiving core there. I mean, you got the 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 speed and the nuanced receiving, uh, the nuanced route running with Terry McLaurin. Um, you got the speed. Sometimes slot can also play outside, and Curtis Samuel. You got your deep threat now, Diami Brown. Um, you know, you got your, your, your more, I don't want to say permanent, but more slot receiver type, Madam Humphreys and possibly their, their final pick in the next film. So they, they kind of have a, a complete receiving core. They, they really have built around that quarterback position. And, and, and that, which I absolutely agree with. And that's, to me, the interesting thing is going to be in the big phrase the last year or two has been positional flexibility. And a lot of coaches want that. It's been hammered home here the last two years. But I do think when you look at that offense, there is a lot of flexibility with that receiving core because of where, what you can do with Curtis, Terry can, Terry McLaurin can line up at, in any spot. And now with Brown, if he comes through, you know, and you watch the college, his college stuff, like those defensive backs were afraid of him. And it, I don't think, I don't know that he's a blazer. He just gets open deep. I mean, he's, a, he's, he's really fast, but I'm thinking in terms of this group, I don't know that he's necessarily the fastest one, but he's going to be fast. And so they, they, but he fills a different role being able to go down the field. Samuel is more of a, you know, a lot of his big plays come on underneath stuff. So I just, I think you're right. I mean, it just feels like there's more versatility in this group in addition to the speed. Yep. Yep. And, and one note, I think on positional flexibility time is is that when we talk about Jamin Davis I think that I I to go back to that pick like I know it was very popular to think that the Notre Dame kid Jeremiah Owusu Koromora was was a you know a, a candidate at that spot and positional flexibility was I think one of the main rationales because you know at Notre Dame he played safety he played nickel he played you know outside linebacker you do it all but I thought in in Ron's press conference kind of talking about what he liked about Jamin Davis it was hey this guy can play all three linebacker spots right. Sam Mike Will and so uh, the subtle nuance of, of when we talk about position flex, not necessarily playing more positions, but playing more positions uh, in that certain group because Jamin's bigger, uh, you know, and, and can handle maybe some of those mic responsibilities. I thought that was a really interesting, subtle nuance on position flex uh, that we hadn't necessarily heard before when talking to Ron. Yeah, and, and then it also, because now you have a couple guys who can play that because they feel Cole Holcomb can play all those three different spots right. too. So it gives you a little bit of flexibility there. Is there a guy that you're, is there one of these draft picks that you're more intrigued by? I would say Benjamin St. Juice, just because I'm not entirely sure how they use him. Um, right. I mean, he he was a cornerback at, at Minnesota. He played some safety at the Senior Bowl. He's got that length. He's got that size. They don't really have a true free safety outside of Troy Apke. So that's still a need for them. I wouldn't be surprised if maybe they look to a veteran there just to create competition. If there's one out there, Trey Boston, you know, I, I am curious if that's something they try to develop them in or if they use them as, you know, Chris Hare says we're all defensive backs um, and kind of rotate them around um, and, and kind of see what he's best at. Yeah, and, and for me, I think uh, on the edge, 
Uh, we talked about those two seventh round picks, William Bradley yeah. King at a Baylor and, and Shaka Tony at a Penn State. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to see, you know, how they envision those guys, because Martin Mayhew said in, in the press conference a few minutes ago uh, that both of those guys are, are would be expected to come in and, and contribute, I guess, obviously. Um, you have to temper expectations for a seventh round pick. But um, when you think about who's behind Montez Sweat and Chase Young, Casey Tuhill, James Smith Williams, but there really isn't a, a ton of depth there. Uh, Ryan Kerrigan is, is still, uh, you know, a free agent, but when asked, you know, if, if, uh, gonna if ask he you might be, yeah. if, if he might be a candidate to come back, Martin said, you know, kind of pointed to those, those two seventh round picks and said, you know, those guys were really looking forward to seeing what they do. And, and to me, it's, it's interesting because, uh, I believe it's William Bradley King is, is really the same size and kind of had a similar scouting report to Ryan Anderson. I'm not saying he's exactly, yep. the, the same player, but when you have a tweener like that, who's six foot three, two fifty, not necessarily, you know, the, those bigger guys like Montez and chase, you know, how do you, how do you get them involved? I don't think they ever really figured it out with Ryan. So can they figure it out with, with some of these younger guys to give them the depth that they need? I think those are the, those are my, uh, questions heading into mini camp, training camp, the rest of this off season. And you know, it's funny you bring up Ryan Anderson because I had to say when I saw that his size and weight, I agree with you. The difference with it is that this one is more of a pass rusher. Ryan Anderson was an edge setter in a three four, and but I do think like they both are probably best in a three four. But in a nickel situation, if you have a situational pass rusher out of nickel, that's what they would look for with him. So, but I agree with you. Like I, you know, I think it's going to be interesting to watch. How do those guys do? How much do they want him to put on 10 more pounds or whatever? You know, so I think those are some things. Nikki, any, anybody intrigued? Oh, you just said Benjamin St. Juice. So yes. never mind. Is there another person that intrigues you? <laughs> the long snapper. There you I go. Mean, Cheeseman, and he wants to be a dentist. So it's not intriguing. Well, I, I mean, Sam, I'm surprised. I'm shocked that you didn't say him, given, you know, some of the questions that we know you're going to be asking him over the next couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> my, my contribution to the Cheeseman conversation is that your colleague, Harry Lyles Jr. wrote, wrote a nice story about, about him trying to be a, a dentist and pointed out that uh, Cameron is, is Spanish for shrimp. So his name and in the article, his quote was, yes, my name is Shrimp Cheeseman. So I'm sure we'll have a lot of fun with that. And it was a good article, too. I would say that. Of course. Yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome. I got to be a dad. So that's 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 my <laughs> that's my contribution. There. Um <laughs> You know, when and it's funny that you brought up Kerrigan too, and I was going to ask you about that too. I mean, basically, Martin Mayhew, I don't know if he slammed the door on that, but certainly, you know, it certainly said, hey, it's like Dean Hackman said, my team's on the court, you know. So, yeah. I mean, that is that's how we all took that, right? I, that's how I took it. I mean, I, I want to, I don't think anything is absolute, but yeah, and, and they've said throughout the draft too that they really view the draft as the building blocks to their team and they view free agency as kind of filling in around that. So I, you know, I, I believe him when he says that, that, you know, they really want to give these guys a shot first. So. Yeah. It, it is curious. Uh, I think, especially to anyone watching last year, you know, Ryan Kerrigan had, I think, what was it? Five and a half sacks and a, a little more than 350 snaps. Like the, he was very efficient and productive. And, and as he, has he told us at the end of the year, you know, without playing those full-time starter snaps, his body, you know, felt great. He felt like he could still start, I guess, you know, teams around the league, maybe, I guess, don't feel the same way. But even when you look at the production that he gave you last year, you, you have to imagine that as a veteran, he's more of a sure thing than, than any two seventh round picks could be. No, no disrespect to these guys. Just, you know, he, he's a, he, it would seem to, that he would be a dependable player. So I, I was a little surprised to, to hear those comments, but I mean, it, it does certainly fall in line with the philosophy that, hey, we're going to be building forward. We're going to be developing the future now. And I and I think part of it, too, I wonder if for a guy like Kerrigan, if he'd want to come back because you're coming back to a place where you have this record. But you're you're you last year you knew you were going to get a role. But now you're coming back with basically a pay cut and a much and a role that, you know, that maybe you don't want to perform. And from there, end, it's like, we'll get some young younger guys in here. Maybe you can develop. Um, into something, but yeah, I mean, it's, you know, and we, you know, the door was always open for him. So last thing here, what, what do you feel like, what's the big thing left to do for this group? What's I guess the big questions that you still might have. I, I guess uh, I think that free safety is, is really the thing that I, I don't think they've addressed. And as Nikki said, um, they, they could go get a veteran like Trey Boston, but right. um, when you look at the, 
you know, what is it? Six safeties that they have. If you count a couple of the guys from this draft, including uh, Derek Forrest, but you right. know, between Troy Apke and, and Jeremy Reeves, Jeremy Reeves with, with three career starts, I think he played fine down the stretch, but that's, you know, that's not the answer. And then I think that, or, or you know, you're not, you can't be confident that that's the answer. Do you flex cam curl there? Maybe, maybe that's in the plans. Um, even though he's more of a natural strong, I don't know, but that, that cap on the defense is so important as we saw at the beginning of last year, you know, where there were some busted coverages and, and really, I think if you go back, Washington allowed eight or nine plays of, of 40 or more yards. And it was really, I think on that last line of defense that, that's, you know, more than half of those, uh, were responsible for. So when you talk about, you can talk about, you know, bringing pressure with the pass rush, you can talk about coverage, but, um, to really limit explosive plays, chunk plays, which are, you know, currency in the modern NFL, it, I think it really, you know, puts a focus on your, the weakest link of your defense. And last year for Washington, I think that was one of them was certainly free safety. All right, Nikki, you're up. I would, I would stretch it to say the entire safety position, just because there's uncertainty with what is Landon going to be this year. I mean, I know he said he's a strong safety. Do they Try him at linebacker um, just yes. to give Curl more time. <laughs> so, wh- what does that mean for that group? And is DeShazer Everett is he is he a strong safety? Is Cam Curl? How do they get him on the field more? And yeah, again, who is your your true free safety there? Um, I would also say backup quarterback, which is not a sexy position. I get that, but it's one of your most important on the field. And you know, does it stay, you know, a competition between Heineke and Kyle Allen? Can they stay healthy? You know, who is your number two? Do they bring somebody else in? Is there is there another veteran that would be remotely interesting that they try to bring in for competition as camp nears? That to me is slightly interesting only because of its importance. Well, I, I think, listen, that's, I, I'm interested in that too, because I also know there's intrigue with Steven Montez. So I think like he's going to be a guy... The, the problem is that, you know, when you start to say that now and it's because it's the offseason, people start to to extrapolate and go too many, like 10 steps beyond where you need to go. There's just intrigue and like, hey, could this guy do something, get to the preseason games and find out if not, OK, he's an undrafted free agent. But I think so. I think like with this group, they're probably going to decide from one of those. But um, I think who's going to be the odd person out will be something to watch, too. So, yeah, a lot of good stuff. So. Thank you guys for coming on. Go out, get a drink, do whatever, um, you know, groom your beard, whatever you want to do. Go uh, <laughs> go rally the troops for to set sail down the Potomac. <laughs> there you go. But no, but seriously, thanks for coming on. You guys are great. Um, tell people where they can find you too. And, and obviously they can read your work on WashingtonPost.com, but find you on Twitter. I'm at Nikki Jabala, N-I-C-K-I-J-H-A-B-V-A-L-A. <laughs> How oh, easy. <laughs> it's, it's just like it sounds. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Uh, I'm at Sam4TR, the number 4TR on Twitter. See, and Nikki, I still have to spell my name sometimes because people butcher my last name. They, they switch the I and the E all the time. So there you go. So The J-H part, you're golden. That's all you need. <laughs> there you go. Well, thanks a lot, guys. Anytime. Of course. This episode is brought to you by Samsung. Moms help everyone be their most epic selves. So for Mother's Day, help mom be her most epic with Samsung Galaxy Gifts. Like their most advanced smartphone camera so mom can take photos like a pro. A smartwatch with next level fitness tracking. Samsung's best earbuds yet to help mom block out and turn up. Or the statement making Galaxy Z Flip 5G that lets mom flex her style. This year, celebrate what makes mom epic with Samsung Galaxy. Support for this podcast comes from Wild Turkey Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey. Let's tune in to their one-on-one with Jamal, a real bartender from Old Fourth Ward in Atlanta. I really get into the backstory of whatever I'm pouring. Out of respect, there are literally years of experience behind these bottles. Wild Turkey, same recipe since 1942. If you want a true classic, this is what you want to order. Wild Turkey. Wild Turkey Distilling Company, Lawrenceburg, Kentucky. Copyright 2020, Campari, America, New York, New York. Never compromise, drink responsibly. This show can be found on Podcast DC, the new local app with hundreds of options in local news, health, and, of course, of the DMV region. Download the Podcast DC app to hear all the Empire shows as well as the other great content. What's up? 
It's Mike Jones from the Football Jones Podcast. I know you're enjoying your time with the John Kime Report, but once you're done, I want to invite you to come over and check out my podcast. Each week, we take a deep dive into some of the most pressing topics around the NFL. High-profile guests from the coach, player, and front office ranks, as well as the top league insiders. Check out the Football Jones Podcast, another fine product brought to you by Empire Media. That's it for this episode. I appreciate Mickey and Sam joining me. You heard their Twitter handles. Give them a follow. And thank you, as always, for listening. I'll have another podcast out Tuesday night with some insight into Washington's top picks. Talk to you next time.